Um, as I said, uh, Ron won't be with us today unless he joins us later. Uh, there, last week, last three days, rather, I, Saturday, Sunday, Monday of last week, we talked about quite a few things. Um, there was a question uh, that Kathy and I had on Monday, and um, I said that I would look at that scripture and give her a response on today. However, uh, before I do that, I would like to see if there are any questions or comments at this time. No questions, no comments. Just, just a Go ahead. comment. Go ahead, Bob. Just a comment. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just a comment. Um, I, 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 I've been observing so many things that have been happening worldwide. And I see on the one hand, the United States of America attempting to intervene ask Netanyahu to be concerned about Palestinian citizens on one front, yet on the other front of Israel, far-right Israelites are attacking Palestinians. And it's just a... Um, it's a it's a comedy of errors to me because this country, the United States of America, cannot um, can, cannot decide what to do with its far right that's attacking uh, people. Cannot even make laws regarding reducing the number of high-powered weapons available to people, and yet we are going to Israel so Israel to have compassion on people. It just, it just seems so, such, a, such a comedy of errors that, that we're, we, we are uh, so hypocritical. Uh, just, just, it, just, it just, I don't know, it just seems that way to me. Anyway, just come. Thank you. Um, would you, uh, would you guys make, make make sure your phone is on a mute, please? Would you check your mute? Check to make sure your phone is on mute. Thank you. Uh, any comments about what Barbara said? My, my response to that is, you're absolutely right. Um, the, dif the, uh, the difference is that, well, there isn't a difference, actually. There, there is uh, no difference between what's happening on the West Bank of uh, Gaza than what's happening in this country. And there is no real serious effort uh, to um, have a ceasefire pause or whatever they want to call it. There's no serious effort on the part of the U.S. to do that. And the reason there's no serious effort is because Biden, ha Biden has weighed his options. And in weighing his options, he has made a decision that it is, it is uh, more beneficial to him to placate the Jews, especially in this country, and disregard the uh, pa Palestinian uh, communities in this country. And uh, he's gonna pay a healthy price for it. When you think about Michigan and Minnesota, and uh, especially Midwestern states, where you have quite a few Sudanese people as well as Palestinians. And in New York, um, the Palestinian and um, 
Well, let me say this. The Arab community in this country has vowed uh, to not vote for him if, um, if he did not uh, intervene. And there are those who say there is no way he can intervene. Yes, it is. Israel get $2.5 billion a year from this country. There is no way that Israel stockpile, uh, what, eight, nine, 10,000 bombs? Uh, but last week they dropped 6,000 bombs. There's no way they stockpile those bombs. So where do you think they're coming from? Not only that, there is a contingency of soldiers and Marines uh, on Israel, uh, Israel's soil right now. And uh, there is a battle group um, that staged at the coast of, um, off the coast of Israel uh, for the express purpose of keeping anyone else from intervening. Now, in, in my word, in my mind, is that they're already, they've already become advisors to uh, the idea um, in Israel. And if they are advising, then they are also responsible for what's happening. So what I'm saying in a maybe a convoluted way is that the United States is doing for Israel what Netanyahu is doing for Israel. Both of them are in cahoots. You tell Iran not to get involved, and you involved militarily. So that, that in itself is um, duplicity. Uh, the, I, I do believe that there has been a tactical error made, of course. Uh, and that tactical error uh, is, is bombing ambulances and communities under the under the guise of um, there being uh, Hamas leadership in those areas. So, th so whatever, whenever they they kill, when they slaughter uh, Palestinians, uh, there's always an excuse, and that excuse is we had we had um, intel that said that there were Hamas leaders in that area. That does not, even if there were Hamas leaders in those areas, that does not justify it. The tactical error, error is um, in the way they are purportedly handling it. Uh, when, the, when the U.S. Uh, went after ISIS leadership, of course, they, they um, are guilty of um, the same war crimes that Israel is because they bombed the rock indiscriminately and had no proof that anything was in Iraq uh, that they had uh, sworn was there in terms of weapons. But when they went after ISIS um, leadership, this is the, what they did. They used intel from community people and they used intel from military sources as well as um, the intelligence agencies in this country. And they and they did they tracked them. And in track when they tracked them, they didn't drop a bomb on a whole village. When they tracked them, they isolated them and, and took them out. Were there a civilian death? Yes, it was. But nowhere near was happening in Gaza. So uh, what I'm saying is that there is a a, a, a tactical way uh, to move uh, to um, arrest or to eliminate targets that are Hamas leadership. I'm done. Questions, comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions before I look at um, Matthew, what is it, 25, 24, 24 and 35 to respond to a question that came on Monday? It says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But the day and hour knoweth no man not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Um, 
when Jesus used the term um, heaven and earth would pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's a, that is um, that is an Aramaic idiom. Uh, what Jesus is saying is that uh, what I'm saying to you is the truth. And he was so um, adamant about it until he said, uh, heaven and earth will pass away before uh, my words fail. It's no different than us saying that the stars will fall from the heavens uh, if I'm wrong. Uh, it, it is an, a, a way of simply saying that you can bank on what I'm saying to you. And when he talks about the uh, no one would know uh, when uh, the time, the end of things would come, when you talked about the angels, you wouldn't know. Well, all Jesus is saying is that uh, when these truths uh, reach fruition, when they when they come into being, no man can tell you, can predict to you when they're going to happen. No differently than we could not predict uh, what, what journey we were going to embark upon when we made uh, that affirmation on um, uh, in December, 20, December 2011, that we are going to um, we're, we're not uh, going to allow humanity um, to end at, for a restart. And since that that time, we have um, traveled to a place that was not known to us um, as. Abraham traveled to a city that was unknown to him. We traveled this journey um, without knowing where we were going and what we were going to encounter along the way. So that um, is the same thing as the um, um, the same thing as no one knows the time when things were in. Uh, if we didn't know the time when things would begin, and even now we're looking, we, we are embracing the reality of harmony. Uh, we cannot give you a year or a date uh, when the harmony that we are so deeply desiring uh, will manifest for everyone to see. Well, Kathy Neal, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Does that help? Yes, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Any questions about that or any questions about anything? This is from Ella. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, in reading, in having read chapter 24, um, one of the verses uses the term diverse places, verse different. 7. Yeah, different places. Okay, all right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anyone else? Well, last week, um, maybe Monday, George, George was, um, my brother George was talking about um, well, he's doing Gamatra with um, numbers that appeared in, uh, in in scripture in regards to forgiveness, seven times 77. And something clicked in me after we had gotten off um, the lines. Seven. What, what is seven? We, uh, we know that Seven speaks to completion. More and more uh, to the point, seven speaks to the completion of man. So how how is it that we derive of that, or what what is the depth of that? When we look at the number seven. <clears throat> Before we get to seven, we see 
six. And six is the number of man. So if six is the number of man, in order to get the number seven that speaks to completion, we have to add a one. And the one that we add is actually speaking about man and Elohim. Six and one is seven. <clears throat> this is not talking about um, opening your eyes and seeing who are help. It's open your eyes and following God. That's not what you're talking about at all. It's not talking about you realizing uh, who created you. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's talking about something totally different than that. Something is more intense than that. When we when the scriptures are talking about seven or adding the one to the, the number of man to get seven, it's talking about man coming to a realization of who it is. When <clears throat> God, when man realizes that it is uh, Elohim, when man embraces that then that's seven. What does it mean by completion? You cannot complete your journey on this earth without embracing the reality of your essence, without embracing the reality of who you are. You will be like a rat on a trellis running and getting nowhere. And that is the reason that we that we see um, the thing that we see things happening over and over again in in um, in history. That is that is the reason uh, that we say here we go again, and nothing seems to change. Well, that nothing that seems to change is um, because. We have not embraced who we are, image and likeness of building. When we, when we truly embrace it, it is then that we are able to complete our journey on this earth. And um, the completion of our journey on this earth, uh, it, you say what it looks like. The completion of our journey on this earth looks like harmony. Um, what does harmony look like? I don't know. Uh, we have not been totally, completely shown that yet. But we have seen the remnants of our journey headed towards completion. And the remnants of our journey heading towards completion can be seen not so much by the wars that are being fought, but they can be seen by the number of females, especially African females, who are in positions of authority and who are taking leadership positions to provide through jobs uh, for communities uh, by the businesses that they um, that they started. Uh, birthing into this earth a feminine energy that is capable of nurturing humanity because humanity needs to be nurtured after all of the um, of the hell that it has been through over the centuries. And uh, this, this journey uh, is not complete until we get to that place where harmony exists, where harmony abounds. And once we are at that place where harmony abounds, our journey doesn't end at that point. It's sim our journey simply is a different journey. And that different journey is found in the number eight. We have a new beginning in, in order to set into motion uh, laws and principles that will not allow the mindset 
of, uh, of those who uh, got us in this predicament to continue uh, to, to, to um, dominate. So this new beginning um, is, is not the end of a journey. It is a transformation of a journey. And that transformation of a journey, is, uh, it looks like the people. Uh, when people um, transform into um, beings that have as their primary desire to bring harmony to all, and that becomes the dominant force in the earth, uh, that is a new beginning. If you really think about uh, from uh, the histor historical periods when um, uh, when Africans were, were um, visited by Europeans, the whole world changed. And it is, it is my belief that the whole world changed uh, because the creator allowed um, the womb of an African woman, not only to bring into existence Africans for everyone in this earth, and the movement of Africans to different parts of the earth uh, ended with uh, genetic changes that brought into existence different, what we call races of people, different groups of people. And I do believe that Europeans were purposely allowed to populate this earth in order for those who are created in the image, which are humans, created in the image and likeness of our creator, to bring order so that as above, so is below. Without conflict, then you don't know who you are when you embrace the reality of Elohim. If everything was hunkadori, then there would be no need for us in this earth to be creators. We are in this earth to create an environment that, that fosters peace and harmony, that fosters loving kindness. We are in this earth for that purpose. However, that does not come by prayer the way we have been taught to pray. It comes by understanding the, the book. Uh, understanding the book means that it comes by you understanding who you are because the book shows us who we are. And, 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 and um, when we really truly embrace that, then what we begin to see is a transformation of those who have been the dominators of the earth, the destroyers of, of the earth, and um, the nemesis to humanity uh, worldwide. It is no, let, let me ask you, are there, are there any questions before I go forward? Comments? This is Ramel. I have kind of a question. Mm -hmm. um, what you were explaining just now in, in the creator allowing the development that we went through, all of that was designed so that we would know who we are, what we're capable of? It was not designed so we know who we are. It was designed so we, when we found out who we are, we would see what was necessary to be created. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. From the beginning, we knew who we were. We just didn't act on it. And if you are incapable of spiritual transformation, of bringing about spiritual transformation, then have you really embraced the reality that you are Elohim, or are you pretending, or are you... Uh, not necessarily pretending, but are you traveling the journey that's unknown to Elohim? One that when we get to an uh, uh, impasse, we make it up as we go. 
Well, we vowed never to do that. If we don't know, we don't know. So um, the idea of, of um, being Elohim is more than simply saying, uh, I am God or I am, it's more than that. It is, if you are a professional um, what, basketball player, uh, you can play as well as LeBron plays. But if you never get on the court, nothing changes. You simply, in your mind, you are a great basketball player. But until you do something with um, the skill set that you say you have, then no one knows that you are a basketball player. If, knowing that we are Elohim and just saying that we are Elohim and not going any further in terms of understanding the spiritual nature of the scriptures so that we are able to bring a transformation into the earth uh, does no good for anyone. Um, I, I said it once, twice, maybe more. I said again, the 1619 Project talked about a nation being born on the waters. It, it is my contention that the nation that's born on the waters was given a book that was pre preserved by those who sought to destroy them. Um, that book that was prepared uh, was a book that was used for domination, for enslavement, for justification of lynchings and anything else. However, I see in that what they meant for our bad, Elohim intending it to be for our good. So the same book that justified uh, slavery, or that was used rather to justify slavery, the same book that kept us in physical chains is the same book that has kept us in, in, um, in mental bondage. Uh, our spirit, our soul cannot be bound but we have been kept in spiritual bondage because we have not gone beyond our minds to process what's in the book. And because uh, we have been told that if we are not good little servants or uh, slaves, we won't go to heaven. And that is the reason that Paul is the darling of um, the church. Not just the church where of Caucasian, but the church of Christians, period. Because Paul is the one who um, made it justifiable uh, for uh, enslaved people to be returned to their quote unquote masters uh, when he uh, admonished On Onesimus to uh, return to his master and, and uh, implied that uh, he was just apologized for having escaped. And then also misogyny is justified by, uh, through Paul's writings. And, and if you look at what Christianity has done to males and females, um, Africans rather, African males and females, as well as Caucasian females, has, set, has put them in a place of subjugation um, that was never before. So having been born a nation on the waters, when, when, the, when the creator birthed a nation, not a country, but a nation, when the creator birthed a nation, that nation uh, has a purpose. And that nation being, being birthed go through many, many, many trials. And the trials that that nation goes through are not pretty. And they are harsh. And the harshness of them has, has made us fight to persevere in the, in the face of, uh, uh, in, in the presence rather of genocidal maniacs. And that, that understanding 
uh, of the book has now brought us to a place where we are beginning to truly embrace that we are Elohim, that we were created for a time such as this, that we were allowed to rear our heads uh, and to search our hearts and, and to uh, endeavor to open the eye so that we could see the journey ahead of us that would bring all of mankind to a place of harmony. So this book was not written, uh, was not given uh, for, for those who are not in this nation that was born upon, upon the, um, the waters. And I do not believe that there is anyone who does what we are doing. I have never read anything that we are teaching. Um, you can pick up bit, bits and pieces from different places, but to bring it all together as we've been able to do, that happens only when the creator, when the universe is God in you. When I first began to teach some people how to use a concordance, I said to them, it doesn't matter how many words you look up in the concordance. If you are not being guided spiritually, you will not get the message. You will not be able to um, combine those words uh, to present a spiritual message to those who are searching. And that is the same thing about um, what we are today. And the reason I say um, I believe we, no one does it because everyone else is looking for heaven after they die. Everyone else is accusing those who don't think as they think of going to a hell that has been prepared by the same one who created us. A hell that has been prepared um, uh, for eternal uh, damnation, eternal um, suffering. And that could not be further from the truth. So here we are. Here we are. Not embarking on the mission, but seeking to understand it so that we can continue to travel. Questions, comments? Let me ask this. Is it, is it clear? Yes, it's clear. You know, Reverend Richard, you never hear, even when they have the seminars, the Sunday School Congress, and all these other little things that they get come together to teach. And they teach, you know, from different books, and they're using scripture, but you, I've never heard anybody say, uh, get your commentary or look up anything and let's get a better understanding uh, until I start, uh, until you started teaching. That was the first time I heard about getting a Concordia. Uh, even when I came into ministry, nobody never told me anything about a Concordia other than, you know, what's in the back of your Bible. That's it. The main reason that it was not told to you is because they knew that concordance existed, but they did not, number one, know how to use it. And number two, it took too much work uh, to uh, go through a chapter and look up every single word in that chapter. And when, when they saw a word repeated, they didn't look it up. They wouldn't look it up. You, if you're going to use it, you have to look up every single word. And it does, if you see the word blessed, just because it was translated as blessed in that space, it doesn't mean that's what it means. So it's a lot of work and work takes dedication. And if you're not dedicated, you're not gonna do it uh, because um, it's easier to buy a sermon at the convention. 
it's easier now to go to the internet to get a sermon. And sermons are designed uh, to keep you at bay. You preach at, not to. And when you preach at, you don't, you can't raise questions. Uh, when you are preached to, meaning when you are taught, you have opportunity to raise questions and to make comments. So that that is the primary reason, because I promise you, uh, I made efforts to introduce other ministers to the uh, concordance, and they had no interest. And, and because of what I was seeing in the concordance, I was no longer a quote unquote Baptist, a Baptist. I was not Baptistic, as they put it. Yet, the concordance was my source, and I was their source when they didn't know something. And, and, and uh, you won't see that because we're too involved in embracing, uh, having authority over something or someone to even think about uh, making an effort to know more than what we know. And it doesn't matter. If you go to the seminary, you go end up in the cemetery. Because if you go to the seminary, you go end up in the cemetery because you go be spiritually dead. Because the seminary does not give you life. It takes life away from you. And you die in the wilderness, as opposed to living in the land of promise, as opposed to living in the consciousness that has been granted for us to travel a journey where harmony is the goal. Thank you. Thank you for the question, or the comment rather. Questions, comments? Um, what, about, what about these people who feel like the Bible is their only source of information, um, not really knowing that much of the Bible was taken from other sources. Um, and I'm saying that to say that people seem to think that that if you're not getting what you're getting from the Bible, the Bible um, then you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and it's really, I guess, out of ignorance that they don't they don't even know that the Bible itself was compiled from other sources. Um, it just doesn't make sense that they would hold you to um, getting information from just for example, the King James Version or whatever. Um, it doesn't make sense and it just it's just out of sheer ignorance. Uh, the ignorance that you speak of is based upon what they have been taught. Um, what were we taught? That the Bible... It's the word of God that was given by the Holy Spirit to righteous men. Um, where did we get that from? We got that from a group of people who simply used the words to keep us in bondage. <clears throat> The Bible, if you really think about it, the only group of people that the Bible kept you was used to keep in bondage was us. They just took Hawaii. They did not go there with mission. They did just took it. The military, the Navy took it. Point blank. They did the same thing with Puerto Rico. But when it came to us, they used the Bible. And 
I, the this may sound crazy. But the reason the Bible was used to enslave us or keep us enslaved and justify it is because it had to be kept intact. Those in that Nicene conference made every effort to destroy everything about it. But it had to be kept intact. And the, and the um, way it was kept intact was a way, in a way, that would justify what they were doing to us and make them wealthy uh, as a result. If they had known who they crucified, they would not have crucified him. Are you familiar with that? I'm sure. If they had known what was in the book, they never would have exposed us to it. It would have been destroyed. The exposure to the book came in a manner that actually taught us to be comfortable in bondage and to keep others in bondage as well, others of us, of course. So the people who don't believe that there's, in, there's anything outside of the, um, the Bible are ignorant because they have been taught to be ignorant. Now, <clears throat> if the pastors did not believe that there was more than, uh, than what was in the book in terms of understanding, why is it that they go to Matthew Perry's commentaries? Why is it that they go through go to Nelson Bible, the footnotes? Why do they go to Schofield Bible, the footnotes? Those footnotes are acceptable because they are there written by white men. And there is no, no um, efforts put forth to, um, to understand what's written on the pages because Caucasians do not believe that anybody of color has anything to say that's important. Therefore, there was no point in looking at what these idioms mean in the language that the scriptures were written in. And in, in uh, Southern Baptist seminaries especially, they are taught that the only Bible is the King James Version. They are taught that the New Testament was written in Greek originally and translated to the Aramaic, and they believe that uh, until they begin doing their own research, and very few of them do that. So there is a conscientious effort to keep humanity ignorant of what's in, in those, on those pages. And again, I reiterate, <clears throat> that book was kept intact for us. Our, our ancestors embraced it, and in embracing it, they did not embrace it as a justification for enslavement because somebody told them about the exit of the Hebrews from Egypt. And at that point, they focused on that. They focused on those events where um, the creator appeared to free people from bondage. Now, why would they focus on that if there was nothing in them that spoke to the divinity that the, the, um, the divinity of their soul, there had to be something in them for them to embrace that <clears throat> and, and to risk their lives teaching that. So 
when we think about the people who are ignorant, it's not because they chose to be ignorant. It's because after, what, 800 years of uh, indoctrination, oh, I'm sorry, not 800, uh, after continuous indoctrination from the 1600s to the present. Oh, and by the way, as a footnote, um, no, well, I'm not going to get into that because they're going to generate questions going to take us in a totally different di direction. We'll talk about it later. But anyway, um, so no one on this earth sees the spiritual essence of the scripture, even the translators who are accurate in, in, in the uh, idioms and what they mean don't understand the spiritual nature of it. <clears throat> we are told that for us to believe that we are Elohim, for us to believe that the spiritual essence of our being is arrogance. What makes you think that you are Elohim? And the, the question is, what makes you think that you're not? So it is, it has been and still is in many cases an uphill battle to get people to see the essence of who they are to, and to really, really embrace it. Even the people who are here week after week, week after week, month after month, year after year. Some of the people on who has been here has not embraced the reality of being Elohim. It, we must, if we are truly believing that we are Elohim, we get to a place where distractions do not cause us to veer off the pathway. And if we veer, it doesn't take much to get us back on course. We embrace, as Elohim, we embrace the the humanness and the divinity of everyone on this earth. So we don't use negative terms to define them. And all of us got to work on it because we grew up with that word cracking out in our, in our, in our um, language. That's what we heard. And, and, and didn't realize that this is not referring to someone based on race. Cracker refers to the one who is beating you because of the cracking of the whip. That's where that word came from. And there were people who looked just like us who cracked the whip also. So it didn't matter who it was cracking the whip. We we called them crackers because they were cracking a whip. However, that word has grown to mean something different, just as the, um, the word nigger came from Niger, and Niger speaks of a valley of kings and queens, and it was presented as a derogatory term in order for us to detest it without looking at uh, the origin of it, uh, the no different than the little little lantern guy who sits in front of the house with red lips that they paint with red lips and, and black, uh, this uh, African holding a lantern, uh, taught us to detest that because it was a signal that this was a safe house for those who were traveling beyond the ground railroad. Everything that is a positive 
in our culture has been presented to us negatively. The whole watermelon thing, the, the cash crop for Africans after slavery were watermelon. And they made a lot of money from selling watermelons until newspapers in the North and the South began to depict black people grinning uh, with, with uh, uh, um, what is it, uh, lips that were much larger than what they were and uh, spitting out uh, uh, watermelon seeds and being, they just presented it in a derogatory way. And we have grown to a place where there are a number of us who detest watermelon. Not because they don't like it, but because publicly to them, uh, it is something to uh, be ashamed of. So all of these things uh, have created ignorance, not, not only for the scriptures, but also for all of those things that are positives in our lives. Whether it be a word or action or an object, it matters not. So, so uh, Audrey, uh, does that, uh, what? Am I looking at the, the, the foundation of the ignorance that you were speaking about? That's right, yeah. Um, the other thing I hadn't thought about either, or hadn't really realized, is almost the whole of the New Testament is written by Paul. Um, and I think it was a, a, a conscious decision by the Nicene Council to, to, to put... Paul's books into the Bible, because um, even even the Gospel of Luke was um, Luke was associated with Paul, or the person who wrote Luke was associated with Paul. All those letters were written by Paul. Um, Titus was associated with Paul. Timothy was associated with Paul. Um, the Acts, if all the all the letters. Mm -hmm. So most of the New Testament was written by either either Paul or somebody associate or one of his disciples. Um, so there's a lot in there that that um, just kind of goes against it. It's more I I would, I'll say it's more religious than than spiritual. Absolutely. And they sprinkled uh, Jesus in there to justify it, to make it look like it's what it's supposed to be. And one the reason, one of the major reasons that Barnabas does not appear in there is because on the first page, reading the Gospel of Barnabas, he said Paul was an imposter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and now I understand even clearer the reason that I said to uh, you guys at some time ago, don't concern yourself with anything except the red. Read the red and don't worry about the rest of it. Because if you read the red, uh, you will get the gist of what Jesus was saying. I understand even clearer now the reason for that. Because everything with the exception of that pretty much was written by Paul, or as you say, one of his disciples. So it is imperative that that we not only understand that, but that we embrace it. Why? Because if you if you don't embrace that, you're not embracing the truth. So if if, um, if Paul was so legitimate, then why is it that Thomas, as well as Barnabas, spoke of him as being illegitimate, an illegitimate apostle, or illegitimate disciple? And um, both of, and both of those books were taken out of the canon. Absolutely. They were indeed. And 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 uh, misogyny took the book of Mary out. And the and, and Paul mm. was a misogynist. So um any questions or comments? I have a question. This is Evelyn. Has religion caused all of us 
to have PTSD one of the causes? Um, and well, maybe ahead. I should ask this first. I thought I was. Does, does mankind have PTSD? And is religion one of the causes of PTSD? That's my, that's my two questions. Mankind does not necessarily have PTSD. Mankind has um, a problem with ignorance of who it is. Now, do we have PTSD? That's become a genetic trait. The trauma from enslavement stay, has been with us. And one of the reasons the trauma of enslavement has stayed with us so long is because it never ended. It never ended. The chains were taken from our legs and our wrists and placed on our minds. We are in bondage to religion now. And that bondage to religion has fostered a new direction for us. And that new direction that it has fostered is a charismatic religion. And that charismatic religion teaches you that if you are faithful, if you truly trust God, you're going to be wealthy. So the trauma of enslavement PTSD. The trauma uh, of, of religion has brought us to that place where we are more, we put forth more effort to fit into a white world than we put into understand our origin. We put in a greater effort in February to talk about quote unquote black history than we do about African history. And uh, I'll deal with that in a moment. So Evelyn, to your question, it is not humanity uh, who is suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome. It, it is not that, a de a depression, whatever it is, I forgot. It is not that at all. It's not that. Because who else has endured more stress, more trauma than we have? Think about this. The civil rights movement started in 1950s when Emmett Till was lynched. And it culminated with Voter, uh, voter um, rights bill and the um, equal treatment under the law, those kinds of things, and none of it is being enforced. Because it was never intended from the beginning. So yes, we have that, that stress, that trauma, and it continues. And actually what we are doing is making an effort to, um, at the very least, reduce that trauma. And the, and um, when you truly embrace who you are, that trauma that existed no longer guides your mind because your soul begins to do that. And if that trauma guides your mind, then you hate white people. You don't like white people. You, you, you pretend to, but you really don't. Um, all of us have multiple personalities because we're one way with white people, we're another way with each other. It just depends on who we're with, how we respond. Does that help you, Evan? Yes, sir, it does. Huh? I didn't yes, understand. it does. Okay, okay. 
There was something else I said that I want, I deal with that in a moment. What was that? Do you remember? There was something pertaining. You started saying something and you said you were going to come back to it. What was it? <laughs> okay. I forgot myself. That's okay, baby. I knew I'd put something out there that I'd go come back to. I just didn't did not come back to me at this moment. I, I do know it related to something in regards to Africa and and um the the trauma that we that we are enduring or have endured. Was it black history versus African history? Oh yeah. Okay. That was it. Thank you. See? Um, black history does not exist. There is no such thing as black history. There, black history doesn't exist any more than Negro history. It's called black history because it separates us from Africa, from our origin. We are a people without ancestors. If we look at black history, we don't have African ancestors. We don't have any ties to Africa at all if it's black history. If you are in this nation or anywhere in the world for that matter, and you have been living in that area for 200 years, and you are of um, Italian extract, if you're, the original people in your bloodline came from Italy, then you are considered Italian. We are the only group of people who call ourselves Black with Black history. Black history, are, uh, <clears throat> based on America, does not go beyond slavery. We were made ashamed to call ourselves Africans. And it was softened by adding America to American, African-American. I don't want us to be soft. I, I know where my ancestors came from. So it is African history. And even the history of our enslavement is African history. It's not black history. Black is a color, not a race. Black does not have a culture. Black does not have ancestors, Africans do. And I know that um, Jesse Jackson, he said that he started calling us African-Americans. Now he said it publicly where they paid us some attention, but we've been calling ourselves Africans and African-Americans or Afro-Americans, my God, for years. It was just, those who call ourselves African Americans were not uh, Africans, rather, were not heard. And even African American, they would not hear that because without you being uh, acknowledging and embracing your heritage, you don't have any roots, any place on this earth. The birth of a nation on the waters did not detach us from Africa. The birth of a nation on the waters was for the purpose of bringing freedom, of bringing harmony to humanity. There was a time I was uncomfortable making statements like that. But we, we are Africans in the diaspora. No differently, 
than the Africans who traveled willingly all over the world and did not bring the harmony to humanity, taught humanity to read, taught humanity to count, uh, taught humanity to build shelters, taught humanity uh, how to use fire, all of these things, but did not teach humanity about his soul. And it's my contention that it was an assumption that everyone thought the way we think. And that's the reason it was not done. So this nation brought in shackles, born on, this, on the waters, is a nation who is destined to do what we are doing, or was destined to do what we are doing. And that is to teach humanity that it has a soul. And that soul is being controlled by the mind. And it is incumbent upon us to transform the mind. The mind must have a metamorphosis. And that metamorphosis is instigated by the soul. And at that point of the end of the, uh, at that point of coming out of that cocoon, the soul and the mind becomes one. And when the soul and the mind are one, then you are capable of not only bringing or seeing the harmony, but you are capable of doing anything that Elohim, that the universe desires. We have not gotten that yet, but that's certainly our desire to be in that space of creator without hesitation and without inhibitions. Even to this day, there are things that um, are not really said because people don't want to hurt feelings. However, I believe that if your feelings are hurt, you need to search yourself to act and ask yourself, why would the truth hurt your feelings? So I am of the uh, mindset that even though we say black or it may come out because you're so accustomed to saying it, you should correct yourself every time you think about it because we do have a culture. We do have ancestors who are African. Our roots are in Africa. That's the bottom line. I read where Jamaica is being destroyed because of bog bauxite um, that's used to make aluminum and chemicals they mix with it are dumped in, in waters outside of the plants. And the dust from it is actually killing people. And now they're trying to go into the land of the Maroons and build a bauxite plant. And the Maroons are fighting it. 1738, they defeated the British and they moved into the mountains and they have been living off the land ever since. I don't think they're going to find it an easy thing to take that land and, and uh, put a bauxite plant on it. These people in Jamaica are Africans. All of us are Africans and we are all over the world. And if you look at the travels of the African before slavery, 
40,000 years ago, Africa went into Europe. Where else had they been? They had been all over the world. How did they navigate that? Abraham traveled in search of a city that he knew not of. And as he traveled, he dug wells. And, and he, he dug wells and he laid stones so that others coming behind him would know that he had passed that way. We, that story is speaking about what, what we did thousands of years before Abraham was born, according to scripture, of course, because I do believe and hold dearly to that, the, the scripture being an allegory. And that allegory was written thousands of years after the African had traveled the globe. but did not, did not spread spirituality. As they traveled, they taught people certain things, but the hearts of men did not change in Europe. In other places, they did. That's why you have the first samurai and Japan is in Africa. So what, do, what am I saying to you? They traveled physically. They left stones. They left structures so that we would know they passed that way. We are doing the same thing. We are taking the journey that Abraham took in search of a city not made with hands, a city that's unknown to us, meaning that a city that we don't have any imagination of what it looks like. But we know it exists because it exists in us. We are traveling this celestial ball called Earth. We're not in physical ships. We are traveling spiritual pathways. And the spiritual pathways that we are traveling moves at the speed of light and beyond. And because of that, the words that we speak must be pure, meaning that we must hold to what we are saying is the truth. We cannot falter. We cannot make it up as we go, and we cannot back off of it because someone gets upset about it. We can't do that. Because we are restorers. We are forgiveness. We are creators. And we need to act like that. We set the tone for wherever we are. We set that tone. Sometimes with words, sometimes by responding to questions, sometimes by our simple presence. We set the tone. If things don't go our way, that is an opportunity for us to hold tighter to what we know. We cannot allow a world that's caught up in what they see to influence us to the point where we respond the way it does. We must see with our eye, regardless of what our eyes are fixated upon. Thank you. Questions, comments? Um, I have a comment and just responding to Evelyn about PTSD. Um, 
when we do all that you said, when we transform our, our minds, our mindset, when we realize who we are, then we can get beyond any PTSD or post-traumatic slave syndrome or whatever, any other kind of syndrome, um, we can move beyond that when we when we know exactly who we are. Thank you. Because you don't know who you are. You don't know your purpose of being here. Any I'm other questions? questions? Go ahead. Uh, when you mentioned about us being born on the water, I actually thought about the um, the natural birth of a child. My question is, I don't know if you talked about it um, in previous studies. What is the water symbolic of? Is it a womb, placenta? Is it something spiritual? Um, it's definitely spiritual. It could not possibly be physical because of the shackles that the bodies had when they were placed in the ships. The spiritual placenta, the spiritual womb, is a womb of racism, a womb that's carrying us to a place of trauma, a place where we are looked upon as being animals. And when we embark from the ship and stepped on the land, the nation arrived in the place where it was destined to be. And The same ship, the same womb that brought us to a place where we were dehumanized also brought that nation that would bring a change to the most ruthless people that's ever walked the face of the earth. So yes, the ship was a womb. The ship was a womb, but it did not birth slaves. It birthed a nation that was enslaved. The funny thing about that is this, The African was the first one on this earth to build a ship. Columbus was taught how to navigate by an African. And the same thing that they meant for our bad in terms of the dehumanization, walking from that womb of hatred greed, and all the other isms. It is not for our good only. It's for the good of humanity. Even for those who dehumanize us or attempted to dehumanize us. In their mind, we were dehumanized. In our mind, we were made stronger. In their minds, we were to become extinct because of the genocide of maniacs who controlled us. And now here we are, the enslaved, bringing freedom to the slaveholder, bringing sight to the ones who were supporters of the slaveholders. And those were the abolitionists 
They wanted us free from chains, but they did not feel like we were human. So we could we were inferior to them. So we were not supposed to um, have equal rights with white men. That was the belief of 99% of all the abolitionists. That was the relief of Abraham Lincoln. I'm done. Mara, does that help you? Yes, sir, it does. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Good morning. Um, this is Janice. You know, I'm just struck uh, after listening to you speak about so much of human history, the similar, um, I guess you could say attitudes that run through everything you've discussed, um, the misogyny and racism, that attitude that wants to control and oppress, um, and, you know, our interactions with it as Africans. I just found that interesting. That's all. It, it runs through all of it. Oh, and the bit about oh, okay. Paul and the, the Nicene Council. I mean, that that kind of politics, we encounter that every day. Like that has not changed. It's the same energy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and we have the same energy of our ancestors. It's simply that our energy were, was repurposed for the benefit of the enslavers. And we never lost who we are. We just buried it. Now it's resurrected. And we are the ones who resurrected it. You tear down this temple, in three days I will raise it up. Divine completion. Um, and speaking of African history, um, when you were talking about Africans traveling the world, it, it's true because the the Olmecs who were a civilization in, in Mexico, um, they have definitive proof in the Anthropological Museum in Mexico City that the Olmecs were Africans, but you never hear that anywhere. You never hear that. No, you're right. And for some reason, I mean, they have all sorts of artifacts down there that are, you can see, it, okay, this is African, but nobody, nobody with any so-called anthropological authority has ever said that or done a documentary on it or anything like that. Um, yeah, because they want to keep us um, not knowledgeable about our our ancestors. So you call us black instead of instead of um, Africa. And the same thing is this, uh, Audrey, in terms of artifacts in the south of France. You never hear anything about it. Question. Yeah, good morning, Pastor. I don't have a question. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to, you know, follow up in reference to what all you know, RG was saying in the uh, British Museum, you know, there's documentation in reference to the Shabaka Stone, which talks, you know, about, you know, our history, you know, talk about, you know, the importance of uh, the hieroglyphics that we spoke about in, in the past, but I think that it's just evident that, you know, we now have the opportunity to be able to appreciate 
you know, what was written in stone. And at the same time, you know, a lot of the, you know, um, evidence, you know, in terms of our origin, our history, and tracing it all the way back to, you know, the um, Twa and Bhuti, San Khoi people, who, who was the first family, you know, to live on the earth. And so I think that there's definitely um, information that's out there uh, that's truth. And just to be able to search and to seek that, I think is our desire. I just want to share that with regard to what was already saying that there is uh, factual evidence in terms of uh, the history, you know, that was uh, given to us. Yeah, I just want to share those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Twyambuchi, first people on earth. And from the Twyambuchi, what happened? Came the Kushite kingdoms from the first people on earth. And that is the reason. No one wants to talk about the Kushite kingdoms. They rather talk about Egypt and not, and not teach that Egypt was indeed a cradle for civilization until it was overran by the Catholic Church. Really, their army, Constantine. Uh, I'm sorry, Ale Alexander, rather. <clears throat> so, anyway, I digress. Questions, comments? No questions, no comments, as Mr. Ron would say. I think this is a good place to pause. Okay, you guys, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I, I say to those of you who are stateside, better enjoy the sunshine, because it was really cold the last few days. But to other people, who have the luxury of not having to don an overcoat to go outside or a jacket. I say to you as well, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> hey, are you going to make the reminder of um, next Saturday? Oh, the 11th. Yes. It's the date that we are going to um, be on from uh, 10 until we get off. And our discussion um, will be We'll start probably with uh, questions, of course, but um, we're, we're, the discussion itself, we look at uh, the Tuarambuti in relationship to the Kushites because we have pledged to, to show us and to talk about how we got to where we are. And that's where it all starts. Thank you. Appreciate the reminder. Most welcome. So we will see you guys in the morning. Great job, Rem Richard. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care.